are now locked into Radio Juxtapose, the home of contemporary art and culture conversation. Coming up today. I made this silver ink that just make it drip here and drip here and drip here. And sometimes I would want a tag that was like so drippy that it was almost illegible. This is Radio Juxtapose. Spring has well and truly sprung. The outside world has never looked as good as it does right now. It's just a shame touching anything out there is pretty much guaranteed to kill you. We're still in lockdown. For regular listeners of Radio Juxtapose, I've slightly mixed up the format for this. What we're going to do is get straight into the interview with our guest. If you find you've still got a little juice left in the tank afterwards, there's a little catch up with me and Evan talking about isolation and the art world. Also, it would set like a really weird standard of like, oh my God, like this is non-discriminatory to the max. This, there was a little bit of me just kind of like, you know, that little, that little tiny bit of the dark side of your brain where it goes... Let's see how far this goes. As always, if you enjoy this episode of Radio Juxtapose, make sure you give us a like, and why not let us know which part of the world you're walking in from. Here's Evan to give you a little bit more background on today's guest. Today, we're, we're really lucky to have the guest, Craig Costello, aka KR, also the man behind Crink, who this week, actually today, April 7, 2020, has released his monograph through Rizzoli, Crink, Graffiti, Art, and Invention, um, and in this discussion, I mean, we're going to get almost 30 years of graffiti history and all some of the major players that, that have been in the pages of Juxtapose for 26 years. Also, just behind the scenes of graffiti culture, that stuff that we actually we haven't had this discussion yet on Radio Juxtapose, which is really special for us. Hi, Craig. This is Evan. Um, first, first off, congratulations. The book came out today, today, correct? Correct. Yes, thank nice. you. Thank you very much and thank you for having me. Are you feeling now that you've you've just dropped the product? That was a weird expression, sorry. <laughs> it's a little mixed to be honest. Um we you know, when we do we work on so many things and sometimes, you know, you work on stuff, you look at it a thousand times. And then it comes out and you're like, okay, what's next? Mm, right. So, it's exciting. Yes, I'm excited. I mean, I'm not like that's that's just kind of how I am, but we're like, okay, we're already moving on to something, and even to the point sometimes we're like, oh yeah, I forgot, like, oh, this looks great, I love this. Do you get that with shows? I've heard this a lot from artists before when they've spent so long working on something and then opening night comes and they just don't have that feeling that they expected to feel. Is that kind of what you're describing just now, and is that something that happens throughout your career? Yes and no. I'm I'm just not a maybe overly celebratory type of person. And, you know, I just keep it moving. And so, yeah, sometimes you work on stuff and you release it. And then, you know, there's other stuff that's already in the pipeline that's in your mind and that you're working on and, you know, you're fretting over the details, etc., so the release sometimes is just it's more exciting when you receive the first sample and see the product mm-hmm. you know and see a finished product right. before it's actually released that's that's nice because then you start to really look at all the details also there's this thing happening in the world right now um it's called the pandemic it's not going too well especially in new york um, so there is a little bit of like when you were putting the book together, you never you never knew that the release date was going to be in the midst of like kind of something that's so consuming in terms of everybody's consciousness. I guess that's probably something that you're considering too right now. Okay, so yeah, obviously the pandemic. I mean, we we had an event planned. We have all this merch that it that you know came in, looks great. We're really excited about. It. We you know obviously we had planned for this sort of thing. Currently, Crank is effectively shut. All that merch is on our floor at the warehouse, and we can't ship it. We can't receive other things, and that's it. It's an act of God, right? There's nothing you can do about it, and there's nobody's fault. I'm not pointing my finger or kicking myself. It is frustrating, um, but what are you going to do? You know, I'm happy that my family and I are healthy. My staff is healthy. You know, we all made uh, a decision 
you know, to shut the office at a certain point. When did that point come for you? So I have a four-year-old and his school basically shut down. And that was a major, major factor just because of, you know, anyone with a child has to deal with childcare. And normally it's a school or there's a nanny. Without that, then, you know, who's going to do it? You have to do it. And then I think, I don't remember the exact date, but the mandate in New York to shut all non-essential businesses, not that Crink is non-essential, but that's subjective, um, <laughs> that came soon after. And I think we shipped as much as we could one more day and then we were shut. Well, this is interesting because we usually, you know, a lot of times we've been talking to people who are just artists and they have the potential to go back to their studio and make work. Whereas you're both, you have a company and you're an artist. So like, is there now you're like, well, okay, so now I can prioritize painting for a little bit. Like, is there in your just daily practice? Do you, what do you change up? Well, again, the whole childcare situation comes into play. So basically we have, we have a, a small house out in Long Island, and so we're in Long Island, um, and it just gives, you know, a space because in the city, you know, you have to touch five things just just to walk out the door, and so and we live in an apartment, and it just would be way more difficult. So we came out here. So since then, we just got the house. Um, so I've been doing a ton of housework. And a ton of landscaping. Oh, landscaping yeah. game is getting getting quite tight. <laughs> how how was it before? It's just pre, it, it's just a bit overgrown and maybe neglected. So a lot of hard pruning. I don't know if this is juxtaposed. This is what they came for, Craig. I graded graded some soil near the foundation. I've done so much housework stuff. It's insane. I chopped. I, I spent an entire, entire day chopping kindling. So here's the thing. You've been, you've been pruning. You've been doing landscape. Like your, your aesthetic has, has a tendency to be a little abstract, a little kind of clean, messy. So like, are you like just a, are you a clean landscaper? <laughs> uh, I can't believe we're talking about it. <laughs> no, this is great. What are you talking about? This is perfect. I bet you never thought you were gonna you're gonna be asked that question. We'll get into art questions in a second. Pruning <laughs> is is a hard pr- of a privet hedge for all of you gardeners out there. Um, so what that does is it kind of it's a rejuvenation. So I basically took it back to just a bunch of sticks, and then I'll let it grow pretty much normal so i'm not the kind of person that wants a perfectly square hedge it's just too much work i'll i'm more i'm more on some like let things grow where they may kind of vibe and let it be more wild and chill a little more nature a little less you know not i don't want like you know weird shapes and it's not versailles yeah (laughs) okay (laughs) Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and uh, steer this in a slightly different direction. We just talked about your book, but we we didn't actually go into the contents of your book. How many years is this in the making, and what is I guess what is the the, the purpose of the book? The book is, uh, you know, it's an overview of some of the things that we that we've done over the years. So it's it's. The subtitle is Graffiti, Art, and Invention. So it's really those three things are kind of the main main kind of guiding words, if you will. Mm-hmm. It's like there's, there's early graffiti, San Francisco, um, New York, graffiti turning into kind of, I guess, more art-related, less graffiti, graffiti being kind of name-based. Mm-hmm. Um, taking the name away and kind of just doing drips and and that turning into this kind of abstract kind of more creative art driven you know still kind of this just thing and then that turning into collaborations products business and then other people also 
working with Korean. A lot of what you your sort of persona is is kind of hidden behind the brand. And from what I've I've picked up on, that's not by accident. It would be silly for us not to go into you a little bit more. Teenage years in the 80s in Queens, what was that like? I think people have a certain nostalgia for New York. Uh, you know, I don't know what other people, you know, think or what their experience is, you know, what their experience was. But for me, New York as a kid was was very, um, very open. Not that I knew it at the time, but just, you know, it's multicultural super mixed you know class race there's a lot of you know like i used to go to the moma as a kid because i had had like a pass that i could go for free i mean not everybody gets to do that to just we used to go to the met and just you know you could hang out and smoke weed in the back and <laughs> go into the museum and it was just that was just that was just there for you and so you know it's it's there's a lot of resources there and a lot of opportunities and a lot of interesting people and and all that kind of stuff. And not just and not just graffiti is what you're saying too, which is really cool. Yeah, not just graffiti. I mean, I was so I I skated when I was a kid. I didn't really start writing until a little bit later, my later teens. Whereas I would say back then in the 80s, a lot of people started writing graffiti much younger, like 15 we're like going to the train yards you know nowadays i think it's much older you know somebody could easily be like 26 and they're like killing streets but then i feel like kids were it was a much younger kind of thing and everyone i knew wrote or everyone i knew had a name so it was just graffiti was already part of the landscape it just existed like i didn't i don't remember a time before graffiti you know, like, wow, what's happening? There's graffiti. You know, it was it was just already there. And it was just kind of, I don't know, teenage hijinks mixed with skateboarding and schoolyard. Had you intentionally held back then? Because you said you were slightly later in your teens than, you know, some of the some of your peers. Were you intentionally holding back on this or was it just not necessarily in your radar because you were skating? Graffiti is also something back then that was definitely a little rougher and you definitely had to be careful. I don't know. I just, I got into graffiti just by goofing around really. And maybe, yeah, I was just into skating at the time. I mean, there's, there's definite similarities, I think, with something like skating and graffiti where you're looking to your environment, you know, for places to do your skating or your graffiti. Where did KR come from? KR is, so back then, two letter names were pretty common. And if you were hanging out with people, you know, in the schoolyard, people are just writing, kind of tagging. They'll write, they might write your name, might write, you know, Evan, but that's maybe a little too obvious. So maybe it would get <laughs> shortened to EP and then it would be become right. EP1. And then potentially, if it's stuck, you just become EP1. And for me, it was Craig with a K. And then that just got shortened to KR. Okay. Because I, I did that mental process with the name and I was like, <laughs> hang on, I can't see this here. Where Where is it? So, okay. So you just, you just flip the C to a K. Yeah. Okay. That makes a little bit more sense. Are there any peers that you had at that time that maybe we know about now? So I grew up with Greg LaMarche, who is oh, yeah. SP1. SP1. He's an, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you might have covered him at some point, or you definitely should. Sure. He's, yeah, for sure. He's, he's great. Yeah. So we grew up in the same neighborhood. He moved to the city when he was a teenager at some point. He's probably the main guy. I also, I mean, I've known Chino since I was like 15. Well, I don't know. I don't know if anybody else that's in, that's still very active today but then that changes when you move to san francisco because some of the people that you were photographing and painting with are some of the big big names at least one in particular is a very very big name yeah i moved to california i moved out to san francisco what age are you there i went to school in boston um i graduated 89 high school and went to boston for about a year 
and I really did not like Boston. Um, <laughs> a lot of New Yorkers say that. <laughs> I didn't see that in any of the articles I read. So I was like, okay, so this is like the quiet little secret that you had maybe been keeping. It's it's somewhat uneventful, but it was. it's just I... I didn't like Boston. I, I didn't really know what I was doing at school. And I just was like kind of unsure. And so I dropped out and I moved back home. And moving back home was a little difficult because I had already kind of had my taste of freedom. And I was like kind of locked down at home. And then I knew this girl who was moving to California. So I was just like, okay, I'll let me go check it out. And then I just ended up staying just like, I'm going to go, I'm going to just see it, what's going on. And, and being that, I mean, I grew up in San Francisco and the magazine's based in San Francisco. What was the city that you um, showed up in? What was going on in San Francisco? What was the scene like? Where are you from in SF? Uh, I'm from Oakland actually originally, but you know, lived in San Francisco forever. I got there soon after the big earthquake. So there was a lot of rubble. And San Francisco, I don't know. It was like, so I lived in the sunset. Oh, way out. Okay. okay. Yeah. I was dating this girl. This is in the early 90s, sunset. I was dating this girl who was going to state. That's why we live there. I had roommates that went to state. Uh, I actually worked in Daly City, um, okay. just past state, last stop on whatever bus that was. And the city was, I don't know, it was just, you know, San Francisco. It was kind of seedy. Yeah. You know how like if there is, there's always kind of a seedy side of SF. Kind of yeah. a grind. I, I'm so out of touch with it now because I've been out of there for a while, so I'm not really familiar with all the tech money. But it was pretty seedy and kind of. Was it a good kind of seedy? That's a good question, Doug. Because it's <laughs> my my memory is that it was both good and very not good. I never had any problems in SF. Okay. You know, okay. no one ever tried to do anything to me or rob me or you know anything like that you know there's obviously been a homeless problem there for a really long time um you know sf right now might have like a lot of gut renovation and you know real estate wasn't through the roof real estate was probably just kind of left alone at the time i mean my rent was dirt cheap i think i paid 250 dollars, and we had the whole top floor of a house three people whoa oh wow so it was it was it was kind of kind of like it, it's, SF is not a flashy place, you know. It's not, it's it's kind of counterculture, you know. In New York, there's a lot of money and people show it, you know. There's rich and there's poor, but the people who have money, you know, it can be super flashy and, and SF just wasn't like that. But SF was like super beautiful, um, for me, just like you know, watching the sunset in the ocean or seeing pelicans and sea lions and just different trees and all that. That was really nice for me. Then we would take little day trips. We'd go to Muir Woods or something, and that was also super beautiful and a big part of why I liked it so much. Had you started to find yourself uh, continuing in, like, graph circles and art circles? I had a job for a while and just worked. Um, what were you doing? I was... So I have a photo background. So I used to work since I was a young, since I was a teenager, I worked in one hour photo places. Um, so I worked at Moto Photo in Daly City. Oh, man. Uh, do you know that? I, you know what? It sounds familiar, but I also know some people from that part of uh, the Bay. So it just sounds familiar. I can't imagine if it, it, there's no chance it's still around. Absolutely no chance. Is there anyone from Moto Photo you'd like to give a shout out to, yeah, yeah. just in case they're listening? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> we had great, we, I worked with really great people. We had, there was like a group of people from New Orleans. They were all super cool. Um, and we all had a really good time. But anyway, I was there for a while and really I was just trying to get up my bearing. And then eventually, uh, as I did, I kind of started looking more at like, okay, like other things to do, if you will. I think that there was a spray paint ban at the time. I don't, I don't remember. There was something weird with spray paint at the time that eventually went away. But 
I started kind of looking, I don't know, finding resources, if you will. So SF was super easy to rack in mm. compared to New York. Just for just for the benefit of listeners, can you elaborate on that terminology <laughs> for us, please? So racking is shoplifting. It was really easy to get markers, uh, spray paint, a spray paint where it was available. Like I said, I remember there was something weird. Can I can I just ask you what was your technique? Let me just let me just say this because today racking is a whole different world and people make a living on it. They have yeah. eBay. There's it's it's really a completely different world. When I was racking, it was very small time, very like you know it's like foraging. And it's very like small amounts. I mean, nowadays, the things that people do is pretty amazing. But I, during the height of just racking like pretty methodically, I had an inside pocket sewn in. So that was just for markers, stickers, really anything that would fit. <laughs> and then I had a I had a bag and it was really just when you when you're racking, you kind of you pay attention to places and what they have and you don't take everything you take a little bit often that's very important don't burn your rack if you take everything then they're going to know and they're going to keep an eye on it so you just take a little bit often and you just keep going back as you need it sometimes you go on a mission somebody with a car and you drive out a few hours you know today with iphones people will look up every single hardware store you know map it and and do that we didn't have that so we just drive out and there you could take everything if you wanted because you might not you might not come back for six months being someone that was racking cans or markers or whatever it might have been and then now being the sort of the the, the business owner that's really <laughs> yeah. trying to sell these products is there is there a give from from you you're like okay i get it it's just part of the game if you find out that people have been stealing your your, your products or are you like have you gone hardline you know, since I don't have a brick and mortar store, you know, it's not something that affects me directly. So rack away. Well, I mean, it's just, <laughs> no, no, it's, no. It's, it's just, but there's nothing. I just, sometimes I hear about it. Sometimes I don't, but it's really up to the individual yeah. to kind of protect their stuff. Obviously it deeply affects where crink products are put in the stores, you know, right. people, and it deeply affected, I mean, we're skipping forward here, but mm -hmm. We'll, we'll jump back. <laughs> you know, art stores used to be very concerned. I don't want that. That's a graffiti product. People are going to come here and steal it. You know, yada, yada, yada. And But eventually, the people who did take the chance, you know, reported back to their colleagues, because it's a pretty small community, that, you know, there's a huge growth industry for them. Because the art materials world is pretty was pretty stagnant. And so, especially for spray paint, you know, for example, someone might come in, you know, buy six tubes of paint and may or may not use it for, you know, six months. Um, whereas six cans, of, you know, somebody could come in and get 25 cans of spray paint, use it in one day and be back in, in a couple of days. Right. And so, so the whole kind of, you know, with the rise of street art, you know what you call street art whatever it's called and the rise of graffiti in the past you know 20 years let's say it's been a growth industry also for the material the art materials industry you know and they've mm -hmm. accepted it and realized people definitely in the beginning really had a lot to say to me you know oh, people are going to come steal this and people would say people came into my store they only stole the crank you know, they only <laughs> stole spray paint. They only, you know, people, people's, people would get their, you know, places broken into at night in a small town, only steal the spray paint. For you then going back into your sort of, into your timeline, into this journey, were you still active when you first moved to SF or did that sort of take a back seat as you were working in photography? How did that start to, to take a shape? In, in your direction? I think that once I got pretty stable, I started really racking stickers. So there were really not a lot of stickers in SF. And I was just doing it, whatever, just goofing around. So I'd, you know, go to the post office, get stickers and put them up and, you know, slowly but surely, maybe 
maybe, you know, getting up a little bit. You know, I honestly don't really remember. I think it was just something to, you know, there wasn't any any plan. It was just like, I don't know, I just started writing graffiti out there and felt that I was stable enough to kind of start putting up stickers and then finding places to rack and getting markers and catching marker tags and then eventually getting spray paint. I had a great spray paint spot. So being from New York, New York at the time was all about Rust-Oleum, black and white Rust-Oleum, New York streets. That's, that's the way it, that, that was like what you did, but almost everywhere else, it was all about Krylon and, you know, people would do pieces and it was more colorful and Krylon was basically a smoother pink. Rusto was, uh, it's like a bit rougher, but it covers really well. You could paint on brick, whereas with Krylon, you couldn't really paint on brick. And I found this um, paint store near my house where all the Krylon was behind glass and all the Rusto was in another section all by itself and not behind glass, not locked up. So I used to go there all the time and that was my main supply for quite some time. And that was great. So it was really just like being able to gather supplies and then you're like, okay, let's let's go write some graffiti. And, and you probably, I mean, for people who might not realize this, but San Francisco is a very small city and you can kind of uh, meet people very easily because all the communities are kind of smaller. It's not like New York. That's such a vast, huge place. It, San Francisco is pretty small. And so you, and you were probably having, it, I mean, I could see doing graffiti. You probably met people very quickly. Yeah. So I'm not the most social. I met, I met someone. I met someone. Oh, I don't even remember how I met him. Yeah. I guess I was starting to write graffiti a little bit more. I met this kid who wrote Crush. I think he passed away, actually. But most of the graffiti in SF was kind of in these parking lots. Um, so they were like kind of these accepted places to write. And I'm just, and, and you know, people go, you know, there's no space and people go over each other. And there's where you're supposed to show up here and write and go over somebody and then you have a problem. And that's just, I'm not into that. Um, so, and yet most of the city really did not have any graffiti in it. And Barry Twist, he, he had some stuff on the streets and he obviously was doing very different, he had a very different style, but he was also pretty prolific. And so I met, I met Barry through Crush and I, I remember just being like, okay, this guy seems like he's, he wants, you know, he's ready to go to town and do whatever and, you know, that he's more focused. So for me, I was just like, okay, I'm down, let's do this. And like, you really don't need anybody else. You know what I mean? It's like, you eventually meet people, but a, a two to four person team, I mean, two is best. Yeah. But obviously, you know, you, you can switch those out. But two person team on the streets is best. Did you find that Barry's kind of persona and what he was doing was slightly different to what other artists, especially graffiti artists, were doing in the city? I mean, what he was doing, you know, was very character was character based and more I mean for lack of a better word, I don't know, like art driven or, you know, illustrative or, or arty, but he was, he was prolific and you could see it. He was driven, you know, you could see that he was, he, he did something in a tunnel. He used to do these like egghead characters and there was a tunnel that a lot of people went to Dubose tunnel, which was on my train line. Cause I'm, yeah. I lived in the sunset. And he did like, you know, 20 or 50 heads in a row trying kind of with an animation concept in mind. I don't, I don't know if the animation part worked, but it was clear that he was like really trying to do stuff, but he was cool. He was normal. Right. I, I think that graffiti writers can be stereotyped. Mm -hmm. um, 
but they're really more often than not not what you think they are everybody's different yeah there's thugs but there's also you know everybody's all sensitive (laughs) um you know there's all different types you know there's like there'll be this guy who's like you know the most prolific hitting the craziest spots and it'll be like some little kid who's you know quiet and to himself that's very common barry was just he was cool he was normal so as you're you're painting as you're documenting with through photography are you getting a sense that they're because now in hindsight those, those are the original days of the mission school movement or mission school you know that group of artists was there a feeling that you could see that san francisco was doing something on its own that was different than new york i mean was there a sense that that was what was happening in the early 90s um no not for me yeah. I, I i think that a lot of one that's hindsight right everything that's happened right. And two, there's a lot of like, I guess at the time, like media media based, like there's been, there's so much more media today than there was back then. It was just beginning, like graffiti zines. Yeah, there was a zine here and a zine there, but it was still just beginning. And that was a form of communication. But otherwise, you had to go to SF to see what was going on there. Whereas mm-hmm. today we see so much homogenization where it's like, you know, you could go to Berlin and some, you'll see somebody in, participating in the same trends that you are, you know what I mean? Or like, yeah, someone is influenced by like Sao Paulo graffiti, you know, and they live in France and their style looks like they've been, to, and they've never been to Sao Paulo in their life. You know what I mean? Like before that, you had to go to Sao Paulo, you know, you had to go to SF. Basically no one knew about crank and mob tags unless they went to SF. It did not exist in in New York. So during this period uh, that we're sort of in just now, what what are you doing on the street? Are you just still hitting KRs? Have you started to move into something? Have you started to experiment by this stage? And if not, when did that experimentation start to come in? So in the beginning, I I was really very straightforward, graffiti, throw-ups, black and white, Rust-Oleum, very straightforward. I was really experimenting with ink and markers. I guess that was my more experimental side. But my graffiti itself was very traditional and very, very kind of limited. I'd say I was just kind of a tag and throw-up guy. But that was pretty new to SF. That was very new to just, no one used Rusto. No one really hit the spots that, it was technology really. The Mm -hmm. being able to paint on brick walls effectively or concrete certain walls and this type of graffiti. I was, it was all really straightforward. I think that crank became something that I just, I made inks, you know, I made some ink and we put it in markers and it worked and then that became just something that was again like a technology that that I kept to myself and shared it with Barry shared it with Ruby who wrote Reminisce and only with my friends you know um, so that we had that advantage and we could coin that aesthetic how were you making yeah inks? exactly like, that doesn't yeah, feel like a, it doesn't you, you just casually dropped that like yeah i was just making inks and it's like I, how do, how do you do that well in, in graffiti just just to backtrack a little bit in graffiti there's a really really deep tradition that i believe is still alive well that i know is still alive of experimentation with tools and with with space and obviously with style but you know you steal your space I'm from I'm from kind of the time where you steal your space, you steal your supplies, and that creates experimentation. You know, you have to experiment. Okay, that was a total failure. Okay, let me try this. Okay, that kind of worked. Oh, now I see how this can work, you know? And then so it was really making markers and playing around with it and making inks just just really playing with materials it's not like it's not like well i had a 
you know, I went to summer camp for chemistry and, you know, or <laughs> yeah. I'm, a Walter, I'm a Walter White. You know, there's no chemistry background. There's no... You didn't have a lab coat. I didn't have a no lab coat, no safety gear, just kind of played with things. Where where were you getting the materials to do this? Like, what were you using to make this ink? Other ink? Can you maybe just go into the kind of the actual details of this process a little bit further, if you can? Classified. <laughs> That's it. Of course you can. I was waiting for That's that. That's what the whole product is. I was waiting for that. What, what's really important was everything I was able to get for free. So really, it was, it's all based on art supplies, hardware stores, you know, things that are common that I could rack, bring home, no cost to me except time, play with it, see what's up, test it, field testing, we called it, and then make adjustments, say, okay, this didn't work. You know, there's obviously a ton of failures, but since, you know, there was essentially no investment other than the time it was easy and fun when you did start to get something to work and refine it it was what was the chicken or the egg thing here was there an aesthetic that you knew that you wanted that you knew you couldn't buy or was it something where you, it was just so much experimentation that the aesthetic came out of that and there was nothing that you were potentially going for and it was more so all this experimentation is now leading me to this kind of look and ability that wasn't there before one is economy having everything be for free was was really important and being able to like get supplies you know to have that supply chain float that was really important and drove what i had access to i mean you could just buy anything but you can't steal anything you know you can't steal everything the other thing was so okay when i was a kid in new york going to school you know, I, I didn't ride on trains, but I rode the trains. And train insides were just crushed with ink tags. They're a little different from what we know today, but those were the inspiration. So back in the day, in New York trains, people made their own markers. And they were often made with felt from a chalkboard eraser uh, as the, the, the tip. And it could be, let's say, a shampoo bottle filled with ink or it could be a roll a roll on like a ban roll on container where you dump everything out get rid of the ball stick the felt in it stick mm -hmm. your ink in it the ink would be let's say hey maybe you came up on some black pilot ink or some black marsh ink maybe you came up on some green you know so then you don't have all green tags because you had a supply of that or all red or you mix the red with the black and you got brown and so these were telling things that people you know if you feel like oh we had green ink that whole summer that was amazing you know and then you had all <laughs> green tags in the in the inside so that was super influential and kind of the idea of and those were called mops so the original terminology mop at, for a marker comes from new york city subway graffiti and so then after train graffiti kind of died in like late 80s 88 uh all those markers they don't work on the street in subway graffiti you generally went to a spot you did your graffiti then you went home or wherever whereas in the street you're kind of ro roaming all around the place so those markers sometimes you'd finish it and you'd throw it away or they weren't really capable you know they were messy you had to wear a glove you can't do that on the street and also the inks, if you were using colors, they would fade in the street, whereas they would not fade in, you know, underground. So people would use, for example, supermarket ink, which they, for the price guns, refill the price guns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That ink is garbage if, if you try to use it on the street, but it's fine if you use it in a train underground. And there's a lot of inks that that people are nostalgic for. Oh, Flowmaster, that's that was the ink, terrible ink. But <laughs> since since it was used underground and people had access to it, then that was just what you used again out of economy. You know, it was definitely people were using materials because they could get them for for cheaper for free. 
when it spilled out onto the streets and those markers went away, the the marker that dominated in New York was a pilot silver paint marker. That was like the marker. And so it was just kind of mixing those two things. I mean, I tried a million other things, but it was like the lasting power of silver and the drippy aesthetics of train insides then applied, you know, I made this silver ink that just make it drip here and drip here and drip here. And sometimes I would want a tag that was like so drippy that it was almost illegible, but it could just hold its shape. You know, the line could just hold its shape enough. And that was something that was the specific look that I wanted. I didn't want a little tiny drip. I wanted something that looked like kind of a mess. But when you looked at it, it was clear that the whatever it was, the tag was its shape held. Do you remember like the aha where like you did that on the street and it was just perfect? I definitely remember being like, wow, this works, you know, and looks great. And then refining it, you know, because let's say the markers I used were four ounces at a time. So let's just say I made 16 ounces at a time, but then I would refine it each time to make it drippier or not so drippy, depending on my, my last experience. Um, and there were definitely times, yeah, where you had, you just had a good time, you know, it was working. Like for example, I know people who back then and still to this day, if I give them a marker and they, they go to write with it on a nice smooth surface, they'll make a sound. That's, that's success. They'll be like, oh yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They'll say like, oh, oh yeah. You know, and that's, that's, that's the best. That's what you're looking for. That's what I'm looking for. Somebody's like immediately within, you know, the first line, they're making some kind of noise. That's, you know, it's a big success. Well, so you just kind of answer what my next question was going to be, but I kind of wanted to ask it anyways, because what you're talking about is all these people were doing experimentation, but the experiments that you were doing crossed over where other people wanted to have that same aesthetic. So like, that's the aha. I mean, that's the, oh yeah. It's like people wanted to do what you were doing. And that, that's something that I think graffiti writers all kind of in a way, that's like a legacy they want to have. Correct. Um, I don't know if it's that you want everybody to do what you're doing. I don't, or do you want to have, you want to have that like, like, oh, he changed a style or he started a style. Like, is there, there's something there that feels like graffiti really, graffiti artists honor people that way, I feel like. I mean, yes, individuality. That's the word. <laughs> is, is, is very well, very much respected. People being able to, you know, express themselves and hold their own and, and be original and breathe, bring something unique. Um, yes, that is held in very high regard i don't think it's conscious you know when you're a young person you gotta you gotta look back and you're like you know teenagers aren't thinking on that level you know what i mean you're you're thinking on a higher level but at the time no one's like really thinking that who do you hold in that regard so i i'm a little dated it's fine so are we i think i think that cost and revs are by far some of the most influential, some of the most influential writer, graffiti writers, probably in a generation. You know, it was pre-internet, so it was very New York-centric, and a lot of people, I don't think, really fully understand the magnitude of what they did and how they did it, but they were also very... um, It was just before the time of like, oh, this is street art. I mean, they had interviews in an art forum, they were in the New York Times, but they were super influential, very open, and did a lot of really new and refreshing things that inspired, you know, a lot of people, including myself. I think people, you know, there's obvious, like, I think Barry McGee, um, he has really done so much and was really kind of like, I don't know, the, the first person since maybe herring and basquiat to kind of bring 
graffiti and street sensibility back to the white cube and kind of you know museums and galleries and that kind of thing and and really inspired so many people and from from there on you know you have people like cause who's just at the highest next level of next levels you know what he's done and how he's done it has been really amazing and really you know he's super smart hard worker and it's just it's pretty incredible um you know Ojemios. i mean these are all obvious like kind of choices but Ojemios again they're in brazil sao paulo um it's sao paulo is a super tough place um and you know, I think what they've done has been pretty amazing and very influential. At what point was Crink starting to take a shape as a as a brand, as a product? Um, what kind of what kind of uh, year period are we talking here? I left SF ninety eight. So when I after I left, I moved back to New York, uh, but I was quite transient for a while. Um, I traveled. I couch surfed. Um, I was in Southeast Asia, um, went cross country, which is kind of whatever. But in the late, like probably nine, probably nine, 99, I met them. But uh, again, I was traveling. But 2000, I was really became very close with A Life. And I don't know when it was. It was before that. But Steve Powers had, Espo had just. Um, he just came out with a book, The Art of Getting Over, which was the first book published on graffiti. Such since... a good book. Yeah, it's a, it was great. And it was the first book published on graffiti since, like, Subway Art. Uh, I'm sorry, American, by an American publisher. So there's been a glut of graffiti, I mean, thousands since then. So at the time, it was a very big deal. Steve is very ambitious. He did a great job. You know, he worked really hard at it. And Steve was like my, one of my only Manhattan friends because I moved to the Lower East Side. I'm from Queens. I'm not from Manhattan. So I really didn't know anybody who lived in Manhattan except for like three people, absolute max. Um, so Steve and I hung out a lot at that time. And he was, you know, Steve is a hard worker, smart guy, great writer, great artist um so anyway he he i was one of the artists in there that he wrote about and that was at the time pre-internet it was nice to have kind of a press piece you know and press is super important you know people are like oh this is kr that's you oh i saw that you know and then anyway i met a life and they were very much kind of reaching out and just very welcoming, very open to to artists, young artists, graffiti writers, really anyone to just build with. Um, that was part of what they were doing, was kind of just being available to make things, do things. And they had really just pushed me to kind of say, you know, why don't you sell this? This would do well. And for me, it was really like... I, I, you know, who's going to buy this? Nobody wants to buy this because I'm coming again from from a place where I never bought anything for, for graffiti. You know, <laughs> I, I probably spent, spent, you know, probably purchased, you know, 5% of my supplies um, in a lifetime, in, in X amount of years for graffiti. You know, definitely 10% max because I used to buy bucket paint it was you know we'd go get the five bucks or whatever but spray paint never um so i just didn't i didn't see the market i didn't understand the market and they they were like hey we'll help you this is cool this is unique um so i was like okay this is a. it was more of a creative project to work on something um i lived around the corner and so we did it and it did well and it's sold out um so i made more that sold out they got press because a life as a 
as a business, as a store, they were getting press and they would push the things that they had. So I had a full page in the fader, like within, I don't know, two months of, of making the first crank bottle for sale, which was kind of amazing. Maybe not two months, six months, let's say, but still it was great. It was great press. And then pr press leads to more press. The, all the Iraq kids, they were around day life and I used to give them crank. Uh, we trade for stuff, but these guys were going nuts on the street. You know, I was a little older and not really going as hard as them. So the entire, um, entire downtown was just covered in crank, which was very, which was totally new to New York. How did you feel when you saw the, the scale that this was now sort of turning up in the street? And I was definitely surprised at the commercial success at that that people wanted to buy it and that there was a demand that was that was very surprising to me um as far as the streets that was normal to me you know the graffiti writers they know a good thing when they see it and and crink is a good thing like you know it's it's fun it's easy it works what's not to like so um <laughs> That was that was great for me because as someone who still had my foot in the graffiti world, maybe wasn't that active, um, it was nice to have that presence. You know, I had a I had a presence in the street vicariously through them. So how did you learn then how to how to sort of take that hat off, the graffiti hat, and then put on the business hat like what were your where were you looking to learn how to run a business how to how to start a company and to make it like sustainable everything really has always happened organically and really not planned there's never been a business plan there's never been investors there've never been there's not like the business guy who come you know who's some sharky dude that comes in and you know, has some, it's always been super organic and based on demand, really. Um, and I think on, I don't know, people, people just digging it, you know, and being cool with it. Like, so there was no, I think what happened, if, if there was a professional, if there was, and I guess there was somewhat, what happened was, is I was selling crink and it was essentially growing and part cash business, part, you know, just, I mean, it was all in my name. There was no, there was no incorpor incorporation and trademarks and all that stuff. And it really got out of control. I was doing my invoices in illustrator they weren't always adding up. Um, you know, I packed every... <laughs> I packed every box, I labeled everything, I did everything myself. Um, and it was growing and growing and growing. I couldn't keep up with it. And the tax situation uh, got a little got a little crazy. You know, just like the whole financial, the, the responsible uh, kind of thing got out of control. And I had to, um, basically, I got a new space, I tripled my rent, doubled my size which was at the time a tremendous risk and incorporated got an accountant you know went and kind of jumped through these hoops to try to get everything under control and that was kind of like a moment where i was like okay like i'm gonna do this like as a business mm -hmm. and made it like a legitimate tax paying business you know like Payroll tax, MTA tax, city tax, state tax, Fed tax, crazy. You became, you became a small business owner or a bit just a regular business owner. I became a small business owner, exactly. I, I incorporated and did all of that. That was, and then that kind of set a framework for, I don't know, structure, um, procedural things, got like the corporate credit card instead of my own card um, and started kind of making it more professional. Was there a particular moment that you remember where you it suddenly hit home that this was not a game anymore, like this was real? 
I won't go into great detail, but let's just say it had to do with taxes. <laughs> <laughs> It's that's real talk. I mean, that's the real, that's the reality of it, right? So, what's your piece of advice then on that for for someone that's kind of making that transition? Oh man, we have a lot of sayings. First saying, <laughs> shit ain't easy. Second saying, if it was easy, everyone would be doing it. You know, there's no there's no one way to do things. There's there's in small business, it's like it's just there's so many ways to skin a cat that it's hard to give advice i'm very conservative i'm i'm uh you know some people they'll borrow you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars, start up money buy a chain you know buy a bunch of merch you know what i mean and go out of business mm -hmm. um, right I'm not that way. I'm very conservative. I pay my bills. Not everybody's like that, you know, and plenty of people are super successful doing all kinds of different methods. I mean, today, a common business business method, they don't even make any money. It's all started the whole startup thing. There's zero yeah. never made never made a profit in their life. And then they like somebody comes and buys them for a billion dollars. I mean, it's insane. And that's how a lot of people are kind of saying, okay, that's what we're going to do. We're going to have this technology. We're going to make, I mean, there's amazing stories like the guy who did Nest, you know, you know, the thermometers, thermostat, you yeah, know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. So he, he took the most banal, most overlooked like thing in your home and like turned it into like a billion dollars, like and, and it's such a what seems like such a simple and ordinary idea in our times. And I'm sure that was all startup money. One of the things that's really cool about Crink and it was kind of when as you were establishing the brand beyond the graffiti community, there was something about like you, your art and the stuff that you were doing as an artist, as Craig, as KR kind of almost became like this potential of what you could do with crink ink and i always thought that was like an interesting part of your story it was that you had your company you had your art and you were able to kind of i guess kind of just really show the potential of what this work could be or what what this aesthetic could be in almost a fine art context could you talk a little bit about how you got into being an exhibiting artist yourself first just to go way back you know I went to art school and so in art school you're exposed I mean I guess I went to a fine art school so it's you know art school could really de be divided into you know something more commercial fashion photography something more technical versus like fine art galleries and mm -hmm. ideas and maybe less less technical more ideas. so there is an exposure um, you know, to just the ideas of just like, hey, you know, making art, you know, like being an artist. Uh, and, you know, Ruby Neary, Barry McGee, Alicia McCarthy, Margaret Kilgallen, um, just to name a few, all went, we all went to the same school. Um, and there was definitely, you know, SF is a small community. Um, so I'd say, San Francisco had like definitely a huge impact on I don't know my my thinking or ideas but um I think that just like you know you're trained to maybe view things through that lens um and for me with what, what was happening in New York, you know, there was, I was still writing graffiti. Um, I totally stopped using spray paint for a while now because it was just hard to get. And bucket paint was easier to get and we were doing different things. You know, I had crank and sure I'd catch the occasional tag, but I, I kind of, graffiti kind of became a little bit, you know, I don't know, it just became a little much for me because with graffiti some people they they love it oh i love graffiti it's i love the pretty colors or 
whatever, but they don't understand it. Other people I hate graffiti, you know, those people should be shot, you know, and they don't understand it. But so I took and then graffiti writers themselves, sometimes they just have they're uptight, too many rules. And I don't think graffiti should really be about rules. And so I took my name out of the equation and was still just started doing drips, literally pouring ink on things at the very, very beginning. So I'm using crank, use it, working with a mailbox or a doorway. So it's the same place, same materials, all illegal at night. Um, but the reaction was completely different. I got, I really broadened my audience and really got a really positive reaction. Um, and that just changed. I don't know. That just opened more doors and kind of. I don't know if I'm answering the question, but it just opened more <laughs> doors are. Into, into different places, you know, from from corporate co corporate collaborations to uh, you know art projects, uh, and just got got a different kind of audience going that was outside of just graffiti, and and again, like I said, just very positive. People were interested in it in, in a different kind well, of way. Well, yeah, you you brought this sort of street like this kind of beautiful street rawness to lots of places where it had not been before in terms of the collaborations you've done. And I guess, yeah, you answered my question because I wanted to know about how those, that drip aesthetic has just kind of now sort of it's yours and it permeated into all these different places and just like how, how that's synonymous with crank and it's synonymous with you. Um, and just like these experiences. So yeah, you answered the question. I'm interested to know what was your work at art school like before this sort of transformation? What were what was your what was your practice and what was your aesthetic? Also, SFAI, rest in peace, at least for a second. Uh, why? What happened? And, well, I guess they 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 closed down and they're kind of acting like they're not going to come back for till next, not even next year. It's weird. It's a weird newsletter that went out. Because the virus, and then they were kind of saying that they might not come back in the fall, not even because of the virus. I, I don't know if they're using it as an excuse now. It's really weird. You know, I didn't know that. That would be terrible. I have very fond memories um, of SFAI. But so I have, I went to school for photography. I, I studied photography. It was all analog, no digital. And, you know, you can print the prints. I could do all that kind of stuff. I was started to become for whatever reason you know maybe it's just exposure and getting older interested in different things and it you really couldn't bring anything to the photography department other than photography and so i switched over to what was called the new genres department and there so there so okay the photography last photography i was doing was super just like documentary action shots graffiti um you know bombing with barry with ruby uh, street stuff and kind of behind the scenes if you will because it was it was just like not you know graffiti was still you know it's kind of a hidden thing hidden sub subculture and then when i stepped into the new genres department i would bring things in like I would save all the price tags off of everything that I racked and make these kind of collages um, or I bring in these like just weird like ephemera kind of things and that's just kind of what I was interested in or I dig out is to dig out pieces of, of paint from a wall and then shave them down to show the different layer of color whatever they might be you know kind of just like what you see you know what's behind it you know there's the face and then there's like layers underneath and kind of a history there that's been covered up and so it's just these things that were not photography you know what i mean like like what is that I mean, and but you could bring that into that department and that was super refreshing so it was like yeah you know, i'd make like monochromes that were just the colors of the city, if you will. So I contacted, I contacted the city. I don't know what department. I spoke to a lot of different people, and I found one lady. She's very nice, and basically, when they were buffing graffiti, 
they only used five colors, you know, give or take, whatever, six colors for it. Was, it was five or six colors. I have, I actually, she sent me a board of the exact colors. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> She's way nice. <laughs> so I, I still have it. And so it was like the red little fireboxes, you know, those like little birdhouse fireboxes in SF. So anyway, it was like uh-huh. red, mailbox blue, mailbox green, gray, and trash can, like beige. And so I'd make like monochrome paintings. It was like the colors of the city, you know, stuff like that. That was still very much like associated with graffiti, but was looking at this different app. You know, I was ex- kind of interested in these other things that I was seeing happening to, I guess, the life cycle of the city and of the graffiti. So in this book of yours, then, a lot of this photography is your photography, I assume. It's probably 70% my graffiti. If it, I mean, my photography or Crink's photography, you know, product shots and all that. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, there's some early photos. I mean, I have so many photos, but the book is is only so many pages. Yeah. So I have right. extend, you know, I have quite quite a catalog of of photos um, of just graffiti in the '90s, action and otherwise. Uh, some of that is in there. So the, yeah, that's in there, and everything. It's basically almost all my photography. That must have been really lucky because, like, you know, there's not many people that were documenting graffiti like this themselves. Yeah, I mean, I think that. It's also kind of interesting because I think today the way things are positioned with the mission school, I think that the images that I have are kind of the 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 graffiti, the beginning of kind of the graffiti street side of that. Yeah, we were all like art students and we were just goofing around and having fun. But now it's like the mission school. But there, it's interesting because the way you've been explaining this and the, the, the stuff you were talking about at SFAI, you've, there's always been a very much like art background to a lot of this stuff. Like, uh, or at least you, you seem to have really, really um, looked at the city and the way a city ages and the way a city grows and really applied that to the work that you do. So there, I mean, it's, it's interesting to look at that entire book and like how much, like how much you've looked at cities grow and change and how that, you know, affects like this whole entire scene and your entire business. And so I assume when you look at the book, you're kind of feeling like there's such a good like tome of um, kind of America for the last like 30 years of just the way cities are. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely something that even when I was, you know, when I was working with Rizzoli, it's like I'm just too close to it. And yeah, and that's something that they really helped me with because so many little things and details have so such different meanings. And and really, you know, with their help editing, I, I needed really somebody to help me to do that because it's just like I fixate on things and see things in such a different way. So the meaning of things there for me is so is so different. You know, I could look at a project and I could look at a page in there and be thinking about the hotel I stayed in. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> like just like, or that you know, or just like the the trip as a whole versus like any anything else really. You mentioned at the start that you know your head is in quite a few different places at the moment for different projects. What is coming up? It's really policy. We don't really talk about anything until it comes out. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> right now, and, and to be honest, I mean, the current situation, yeah. uh, you know, obviously, I don't know how it is. It's different for every business. But, for example, you know, supply chain, if X Factory isn't open, that's going to affect what I can put out. Same with, if you know, these stores are shut and they're not buying that affects what I can sell and so 
there's it's there's a lot of unknown. We had a lot of things postponed. I mean, the the, the amount of things that have been postponed is crazy. Mm. It was so weird. Just as as soon as you said that, I it was at that moment I realized that for the length of this conversation, I think was the longest in the last three weeks I've been in a conversation where I haven't thought about coronavirus and it was only i asked the question about what's in the future completely forgetting you forgot, the first didn't time you? <laughs> that we were in this situation uh because i was i was living in 1990s san francisco and through the story of new york there that was the first time i'd been able to switch off for that length of time good i was that. actually gonna ask i was gonna ask craig if if his sales in arkansas are up because that might be the only state that's still open now, where where it's been it's been terrible it's been, t you yeah. know, and I mean, I have friends with restaurants that very early on had to lay everyone off and close, you know, yeah. and it's, it's, uh, it's very, very difficult out there. And, you know, we're, we're at a point in our lives where we're really, you know, it's very real to be like, thank God I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Thank God my kid is okay. My wife. And do you know what I mean? And like, and then you're just riding it out because it's not like, oh, you know, KR, he's got a gambling problem. He just, he just, <laughs> he blew it. You know what I mean? What a, yeah, right. What a douchebag. Like, it's just, it's not, it's out of our control. That's well, it. I, I, I don't yeah. want to end on that, man. I, can't I, I know. <laughs> No, but it it is really nice to to talk about something that you put a, a lot of hard work in that is a physical, tangible uh, book that people can. There's a lot of pressure, I think, for some people. Like, oh, you know, I'm baking, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, and I mean, you don't you don't really have to be doing anything. Yeah, I just happen I, to have been gardening. No, I think that's a good way of looking at it. I. I feel like a lot of people need to realize that too. You don't have to do anything right now. You can just do the things that make you happy, but you don't force yourself into a new project just because everybody on Instagram is. I, you know, I don't know if it's being a New Yorker or personality type, but I go crazy. I like have to, you know, I'm the kind of person who's just like, okay, well, I'm just going to reorganize this entire thing, you know, and I've just been doing that. I'm somewhat running out of projects like physical projects to do. Thank you so much for your time, man. This is awesome. Yeah, thank, thank you so you much. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And everybody, please stay safe and hope to see you soon. I'm not just, I have a, a window that overlooks onto a street, so I'm just, I, and it catches the sun. <laughs> it catches the sun between about 11 and three. I'm just leaning out the window every day, shouting at strangers, just trying to speak to someone else apart from my girlfriend. It's like you're having your Virginia Wolf moment. You're just like just going through the daily the daily motions and just so intricate. I look out the window, the breeze comes in. <laughs> I shout obscenities at strangers. What? I just shout at strangers, tell them to stand two meters apart. How's Boris today? Oh, do you know what, man? So Boris nearly died. Yeah, right. It was really weird. It was really weird because I found myself in that, just that place of like, I've spent the last 10 years condemning this guy, criticizing this guy, telling, proclaiming to the universe how much I detest this man and his politics. And as soon as I heard he was in intensive care, I was like, on Twitter. I wish you a speedy recovery, Boris. Like, oh my God. And I was, it was just that thing. I was like, do you know what? Right now I have no time to listen to anyone give me, he deserves everything he can get. You know, he deserves to die. He deserves to see what it's like. I'm sorry. That, that doesn't get us anywhere. It gets us nowhere. It would be harder if it was for Trump. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> I feel less of an affiliation. Well, I mean, I think, too, I think too with Bo I think with Boris too. It's like it does really throw your country into turmoil. Further, we don't need that. If the prime minister were to die, also it would set like a really weird standard of like, oh my god, like this is non discriminatory to the this, max. This there was a little bit of me just kind of like you know that little that little tiny bit of the dark side of your brain where it goes. Let's see how far this goes. How fucked up is this yeah. whole thing going to go? Great Britain lost its prime minister. That's a pretty big deal. That's like, okay, the gloves are off. If the prime minister of Britain can go, 
anybody can go. Well, also, it kind of gets into that thing, too, where, like, are we going into the 28 days later, like, uh, model, where it's, like, streets are stranded for, like, months and months and it's just like tumbleweed and like you know by big ben you know i don't know it's just it's yeah that's kind of how it f- feels here like i took a walk yesterday and there was just nobody <laughs> it's just just nobody anywhere and i was like is this how it's gonna be for another month and a half yes i've been trying to do this video project where i kind of like low-key go out and get some cool shots oh of, cool you know all yeah, the empty yeah. stuff yeah, but it's always so busy. I'm like, why do, what the hell are these people doing here? I've watched the videos on LA. I've seen it on Amsterdam. I've seen it in all these cities, New York. And I, I went to, I was like, cool, I'll just low key do one in London, just like hood up, just gonna, I'm on my bike. I'll just kind of get the shot and go. And every time I go down, it's like, wow, there's, there's so many people here. Why? Why are they here? They're not, <laughs> like, they're, what are you doing? They're really not supposed to be here on my set. Like, <laughs> guys. Clear. Clear. Yeah, guys, come on. I'm going for the dramatic Guardian photo essay I'm assignment not that here. Good After Effects. I can't just like make them disappear. The interviews I've done with people have like def- the tone has changed now a month into this. Where I'm like not as I'm kind of like, so uh what uh what do you do for uh what do you what do you have for lunch? You know, like just like so desperate to know what people are doing. Just yeah. so desperate. Yeah, yeah. No, that sounds nice. Um, you know, where'd you get your bread? Like, what? <laughs> what is he just so? How did you get hold of fresh bread? Where did it come yeah, like, from? What <laughs> is going, yeah, what is that? What is that? What is that almond butter? Oh my god, I can deal for that right now. What's the one thing that you're doing and or buying that is so out of character, but now you're like, fuck it, I'm just fully in on it. It's a Tuesday night, and I had takeaway pizza tonight. You don't do that normally? No. No, no, okay. no, no, no. I would never I, I would never order food during the week. Because days don't matter now. What about you? I, I just started drinking, which is good. <laughs> just? Oh my God. I had taken like a month off. How did that feel? Good? Great. My drinking hasn't gone up necessarily. My home drinking has gone up. Like I don't usually of drink. Course. I don't drink at home usually yeah. that often. Like it's just, it's all off the table. It's like, who cares? It doesn't really matter. It doesn't, yeah, it doesn't, it I don't. doesn't matter anymore. As long as you're doing what you need to do to get through this, then fine. Whatever that is, whatever your situation is, you've got to do what you need to do to get through this. And that, if that means eating takeout in the middle of the week, fine. If that means drinking a, cu- a couple of extra beers, you know what? Fine. Just get through it and keep yourself sane. It does feel like the art world is officially stopped. The art world, the art world came world in, hard. in hard. It did. It really <laughs> did. It really did. It was like, we're going to do it. Well, and it felt, it was like too bad because it felt like all these galleries had like art shows that were ready to open up in the beginning of April. And then they unfortunately had to just do these virtual things which is the same thing they were kind of doing the weeks before so it's kind of like there's almost like this okay so this is it now virtual tours some of the instagram live stuff with artists walking through the shows i've watched and i've enjoyed Mm -hmm. um but i don't think this is like i don't i can't see this being like the uh nurturing future of our scene I feel like mm. people still want to go to an opening. They still want to walk into galleries. I, th- I think that's just one of the things that it's it's hard to just replace it with a virtual experience and hope that hope for the best. So there you go. That was KR Craig Costello. If, if you enjoyed listening to Craig talk, then make sure you go find yourself a copy of his book, Crink, New York City, Graffiti, Art and Invention, published by Rizzoli, available now. We'll be back with you guys real soon. Till then, take care, look out for each other, stay safe.